Good morning and welcome to St. Mark. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We're here to bring in Christ with reverence and joy and awe. So welcome to worship and uh, I want to lead it off on this note. We're here to fight. We're going to do a little spiritual warfare this morning. I want you to notice how God is our king and he's the one who's fighting for us and with us in that battle. And on that note, I'd like to invite you into this first hymn. Please join us if you feel comfortable. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, 
and for those who offer here their worship and praise. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either, we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Here at St. Mark, we're rooted on the Word of God, and we're going to begin with our first lesson for today, which is Hebrews chapter 11. And here we get a summary. We're actually in a sermon series on the life of Abram. Here we get a summary from the writer of, to the Hebrews on the life of Abram. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abram, when he called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is God's word. We have a tradition here at St. Mark to, that we stand to honor the life and the work of Jesus, so please do that now. Please stand out of respect for our Lord Jesus. He gives us a teaching here in Luke chapter 12, 
teaching us to fight for real treasure. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. You're invited to sing the hymn of the day. This is a very biblically rooted hymn that helps us reflect on how people in the world live and how God calls us to live in Christ.
We're here in a sermon series on the life of Abram, and we're learning how to live by faith. And with that brief comment, we're going to roll right out into Genesis here, chapter 14. At the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Ariok king of Elisar, Ketalomar king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyim, these kings went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Adma, Shemeber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For 12 years they had been subject to Ketalomer, but in the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year, Ketalomer and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Rephaites in Ashtoreth, Karnaim, and the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shava, Kiriathayim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as Elperin near the desert. Then they turned back and went to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh. And they conquered the whole territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites, who were living in Hazazun Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Sidim against Ketalomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits. And when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fled into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot, in his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Ketalomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Ashkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. This is God's word. I think what's most obvious about this chapter is that it's a war account. It's more than an account of a battle. There's three battles in it. It's most obvious. It's a war account. It's a big war. Remember at one of the seminaries I attended, the professor who was teaching on this pointed out that this quite possibly could be called the world's first world war. It's a big deal. You'll notice that there's even the East versus the West, same kind of thing it is today actually, the East versus the West, four kings versus five. Except in this case, this is early in humanity, so it's relegated to the Fertile Crescent, which is the cradle of humanity. It's a big deal. It's a world war. It's most obvious. 
It's also quite obvious why we're told about these battles, why we get this picture of this war. It's to teach us about the character, about who Abram really is, see? Because when you stare at it, when you realize, here's what's happened, you get the first battle, and the first battle is Ketelomer gets his guys together, four allies. Did you notice it's even kind of like NATO? Like you go get the big guy, Amraphel. You know, this is kind of like the United States at that time because he's the king of Babylon. And he comes in, and they just conquest these small vassal states who had rebelled against Ketelomer. That's the first round of the battles. But after that, they're just getting started. They put down the rebels and then they start to roll. They start to roll. They come closer and closer. We can't track the geography. I don't have it up on the screens, but if you track the geography, all of a sudden they're like a noose tightening around Sodom. They're coming closer and closer and closer. And what they're doing is they're conquering. They're conquesting all of the tribes in the area. And then they finally get to Sodom. And they get to Sodom, and what happens is this. Sodom immediately surrenders. They're too much. Oh, it's embarrassing for Sodom. Did you catch it? They don't put up a fight at all. The soldiers run for the hills. The kings start jumping in tar pits. It's embarrassing. And what ends up happening is Lot gets swept away as a war POW. See, when you get that, when you get that, then you start asking yourself some questions. What in the world is this tenting, nomadic Abram going to do against the world's greatest powers? What's he going to, what's he going to do? He's going to roll out against a superpower? He's going to get his guys together and take them. What's he going to do? How's he going to do this for Lot? See, then you start to get it because, because this guy comes running to Abram. He says, look, this is what happened in Abram. All of a sudden, he doesn't ask if he's going to do it. See, he doesn't even ask. I'm going to talk about that more later. He doesn't ask if he's going to do it. He just says how. And he gets his guys together, 318 guys, and they roll out. And they come together, plus the allies, and they, they make this plan. It's the middle. We're going to do it in the middle of the night. We're going to separate our guys. We're going to attack from two directions, and we're going to create confusion, and hopefully it works. And by God, oh, come on, Christians, you know I'm saying that very carefully. By God, it works. They do this Navy SEAL attack. It's way better than an, an, an extraction of Lot. Everybody and everything comes home. So I think it's obvious that's the bulk of the chapter. But it's not what the chapter's about. This isn't about Abram's war prowess. You find that out because the chapter keeps, it's not about, this isn't about war tactics. This is about what is in Abram's heart as he does it. Let me put it another way. This this isn't about physical warfare. This is about spiritual warfare. Okay, now you see it. I think the pastor's got a sermon cooking It's about spiritual warfare. It's about the battle in the heart that everybody undergoes. Abram shows you what's in his heart. It's about spiritual warfare. Now we're starting to get biblical. Ephesians chapter 6, biblical spiritual warfare. We all fight. Sometimes I wish that we saw that a little bit more clearly. I think I'm going to help you do that right now. Spiritual warfare. I... I think we need to resist as Christians in our culture reducing what spiritual warfare really is. A lot of times in our culture today we get reductive with it. We we don't see the whole picture. We don't don't see everything that's going on. We Christians, we we have to expand our view a little bit. 
I was thinking about that the other day. I don't remember where I saw it, but there was this, there was this woman, she had this big T-shirt, and it was, there was letters, and there was this phrase emblazoned across her T-shirt said, mental health matters. I couldn't agree more, by the way. It does. Mental health matters. I agree. What I'm trying to say here is that it's reductive. Thinking about mental health is not the whole picture. There's, a, there's a, a guy by the name of Philip Jenkins. He writes a book. He talks about this. He compares and contrasts how global Christians think about things and then how Christians in the West think about things. We often get reductive. So, for example, when we're, we're th- we think about mental health, we think about anxiety, and we think about depression, then we get our, out our DSM manuals, whereas people in global Christianity will say, Pastor, will you come pray with me? It's different. We see, we have see, we see somebody. They may, they have, they had a psychological breakdown, and we get out our psychotropic drugs. And people in gl- global Christianity, they might say, "I better call the priest or the pastor. It's time for an exorcism." <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to referee this. I'm really not. I'm just trying to say. I think what we need to do is open our eyes to realize that mental health is reductive. It only names one thing that's going on, and sometimes there's more than one thing going on than just your mind. There can be other minds that put your mind under attack. Now we're thinking biblically. There's more things going on inside of your body than just your spirit. The Apostle Paul says there is a whole host of unseen spirits that is actually your battle. See? So we're talking about spiritual warfare. Everybody's fighting. You're fighting. I'm fighting. Everybody's fighting. And what we need are tools to fight. And that's what this helps us with give you three applications. Number one, this text helps us understand what the fight is. We've got to clarify that. What's your fight? What did Abram fight for? Did he fight for land? No, he didn't fight for land. He could have fought for land. You know what he could have done? If he was, if he was Napoleon, this is what he would have done. This is what he would have done. He would, he, would, he, would, he would have had this smashing victory, and then he would have realized the whole promised land is open for attack. He could have picked up his sword and, and conquested the whole thing. He could have. It would have been easy. He doesn't. He's not after land. He's not after retaliation. He's obviously not after retaliation. He gets his guys, and then he goes home. He's not after retaliation. What's he after? Quite obvious. The man's after Lot. It's Lot, Lot, Lot. If you weren't here last week, we found out Lot. He's kind of a, you know, spiritual brat. That's putting it nicely. He 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 wasn't good to Abram. He wasn't, he wasn't worth it. Abram, it doesn't matter. He fights for him. Why? What's the fight? Don't you see it? The fight is for love. Oh, I'm such a broken record, aren't I? Those of you who have been listening at St. Mark over the past few weeks, I'm such a broken record. He's talking about love again. Yeah, I'm talking about love again. You can either get bored with that or you can say, you know what? The pastor's in it to win it. <laughs> he sounds like the Bible. <laughs> Just won't stop talking about love. I was reading one of our confessions this week. You know what it says? Love is the king of the virtues. It's the king of the virtues. You've got love. You've got everything you're going to do. You're going to have the proper relationship with God. You're going to have the proper relationship with other people. Love is the king of the virtues. So yeah, I'm talking about love. It's where your fight is at. You've got to discern that in your life. See, some, some of you think that your prime fight is against depression. Now, let's be clear. We do fight depression. And I, 
I'm here to help you. Pastor, I'm here to help you. We have wonderful resources in the Christian faith to fight against oppression. But maybe there's a deeper battle. Maybe actually your fight's for love. Maybe when you're in, in the midst of the sadness, your real fight is to love and trust the God who has promised to bring you through it, even if you feel like you're in a pit 100 feet deep. Maybe real fights for love. Some of you think, some of you think, I know I'm supposed to fight. I'm supposed to fight those people in the culture who are messing everything up right now. That's who I'm supposed to fight. I'm ready, Pastor. We got to fight the people in the culture who are messing everything up right now. You better think again. You know what Paul taught? He said, Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. If you're fighting against people, you're fighting against God because God loves people. What's your fight? Your fight is actually to do what Christ taught you to do, which is to love your enemy. That's your real fight. Your fight's for love. See, some of you have anxiety. Some of you have anxiety. You, your fight, your fight might not be anxiety, although we do fight anxiety. Your fight might be to let your life go and realize God has a better plan for your life than you do so you don't have to worry about it. Don't you see it? Your fight is for love. So that's the first point that Abram shows us. Here's the second one. He shows us how to fight. He shows us how to fight. Here's what we can do, just a little bit of comparing and contrasting. You do have the sodomites here. They show us how not to fight. <laughs> you know, is that right? Like the kings come and, and it's embarrassing for them. It's so embarrassing. The, the, so, the, 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 the battle starts and then it's over before it's even started and the soldiers are running for, for the hills and the kings are jumping into tar pits. And it's embarrassing. It reminds me of this, this kid's show I once watched. It was a movie. I can't remember which movie it was, but there was these mice in the movie and the mice, they were making fun of French people, which wasn't a very nice thing to do, and I apologize, but they were making fun of French people. And the, and the, and the, the mice came out, and there's this battle, and, and, and before the battle, the, a bullet ever flies, they say, V, surrender! And it's, it was embarrassing. It was a bad French accent. I tried. See what that's a saying? They were sodomites. That's what you do. When you're, when you're living life for comfort, when things get uncomfortable, you quit. Oh, that might hit a little bit closer to home than we'd like. I was asked to read this paper recently. It was put out by a pastor who was doing this analysis of Americans. He said a lot of Americans live for their comfort and their pleasures. So this is what the, the, the paper had a proposal said, this is how you help Americans who, who, who struggle with this get comfortable. What, what you got to do is you got to teach Americans that, that they can't always have the life here that they want to have. And, and of course, it's true. We call that a theology of the cross. You, things are going to be messed up here. There's too much against God. There's too much against love. It's, it's not going to always work out the way you want. There's sin, brokenness, all that stuff. And so it, the paper argued that if you just have your expectations right, then, then that's the way that people will be okay with being uncomfortable. And on one level, that's true. You've got to have your expectations right. You're going to be really disappointed in life if you think everything's going to be great because it's not all going to be great. On one level, it's wrong, though. We have so much more in the Christian faith. Don't you see that? We get to do so much more than help people get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which is just another form of helping people be comfortable with their lives. Do you know what we have? 
We have a reason to be uncomfortable. We have purpose. We have purpose so deep and so important that we are willing to suffer for it. But there he goes again. He's talking about love. <laughs> so the Sodomites, they don't have it. They don't have a reason to live, and so they just give up. We surrender. Totally capitulate. And then there's Abram. And what's he do? Aren't you inspired? Can I, I mean, aren't you? He's against the whole world. (laughs) One person is in trouble. Abram says, let's roll. You know what I think? And I think there's basis in the text for this. I think Abram was known for this. I really do. Did you notice that in verse 13? There's this guy, this unnamed guy. Escapes from the battle lines. Where does he run? He runs to Abram. Why does he run to Abram? Why does he? Why? Because he was the only guy in the entire region who might do something about it. You know, I know a guy. I know a guy who might stand up. I know a guy who might do something about it. I know a guy who might fight. So the guy runs to Abram. And Abram says, let's roll. So brave. So courageous. I hope we don't have to be brave and courageous quite in that manner in this country. I pray for that. I don't want there to be war here. Still, you do have to be courageous as a Christian. Do you know what I think takes courage? I think it takes courage to be a young person who's doubting their faith and then to go and talk to somebody who can help you. I think that takes courage. It's, you know, it's easy. It's easy easy to talk to your friends about it because they might just agree with you. It's, It's easy just to walk away from the church. That's easy. It doesn't take any bravery at all. What's hard is to talk to somebody who might challenge you and help you and change you. Takes courage. I think think it takes courage to to deal with lovelessness in your life. I think it does. I've done a lot of pastoral counseling over the years. You know what the, probably the smallest caseload in pastoral counseling is? People coming to me and saying, Pastor, I've got bitterness in my heart. I've got alienation with somebody in my family. I don't counsel that much in that. And I don't think that's because we have all of these overflowing, loving relationships in every single one of our families. Takes courage to deal with lovelessness in our hearts, to fight for that, takes courage. What I'm trying to say is, this is in our spiritual DNA. Don't you see that? This is the father of our faith. What what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? The Holy Spirit came into us and he gave us the spirit of cowardice. No, he didn't. You know what the Bible actually says? It says when we were reborn by baptism, it says that God gave us a spirit not of cowardice, but of power, love, and self-discipline. This is in our spiritual DNA to be courageous. I don't think it can be done. Yes, it can be done by the power of God. Yes, I will fight. It's in our spiritual DNA to be courageous. We got Abram showing us this. In fact, you know what? to be just a little provocative this morning. There's been a lot of courageous people in history. You can look at the Greeks. You can look at American soldiers today. A lot of brave people in history, but do you know what is the longest history in that? The true home of the brave is the church. That's true. This is the home of the brave. See, with Abram, you see it more recently. 9-11's coming up. Todd Beamer. 
guy leaves his wife who's expecting and two young kids at home. Figure out there's hijackers on the plane. So he calls. He uses one of those airplane phones and he calls. He's trying to get a hold of his wife, Lisa. Instead, he gets a hold of a phone operator by the name of Lisa Jefferson. And do you know what he says? He says, tell my wife and kids I love them and will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Then he drops the phone and he says to some guys around him, now, let's roll. Don't you love that? Pray the Lord's Prayer. Let's roll. That's a Christian. That's a Christian. We don't roll over, we roll. We don't cave, we care. We don't quit, we get going. That's a Christian. Abram shows you that. But now part three. How do we live this way? What is the heart? What is the fight in the fight? What is the heart of your fight? How do you live this way? Abram shows you. You get this, you get this king. You do get this king, the king of Sodom. He comes out. He had been hiding in a tar pit. He pops his head out like a gopher <laughs> after it's all done. And he comes up to Abram and he's kind of sassy and blunt. Even though Abram had won the battle, he comes up to him like a typical ingrate. <laughs> and he says, you keep all the stuff. Just give me my people. And Abram says, no deal. You keep it all. I don't want a dime. I don't want a thin dime. I don't want a thread from a t-shirt. I don't want a thong from a sandal. Now I'm quoting Abram. I, you keep it. I don't want a dime. You keep it all, king of Sodom, because I don't want you to be able to say that you made me rich because God did. So you keep it all. Don't you see it? Abram loved God. He loved him. And he knew where all of his victories and all of his wealth and all of his blessings came from. They came from God and he wasn't going to let anybody think differently. Not one soul. Abram, down in his heart, believed God. I'm saying that with meaning now. You know what I hear sometimes? I hear sometimes people say this. He believes in God. When they say it, so-and-so believes in God. So-and-so believes in God, they say. So what? It's not impressive. You ever thought about, have you ever thought about that? It's not impressive to believe in God. <laughs> hey, hate to break it to you, but most of humanity and all of world history has believed in God. The psalm, you know what the psalmist says? The psalmist is quite sarcastic about it, in a way. I paraphrase the psalmist. The psalmist says that basically anybody with a brain believes in God. It's not impressive at all to believe that God exists. Everybody should know that. It's not impressive. And it's not faith. Abram didn't believe in God. What did I say? He believed God. Don't you see the difference? See, see, faith is more than just believing that there's a God out there that maybe you can pray to. Faith is believing that God is going to bless you no matter what. That's faith. faith that's, got, that's, that's a kind of faith, the maker of heaven and earth. He's on your side. That kind of faith is so powerful that if a world war comes sweeping your way and then it touches your family, you don't even have to blink. Why? Because God is greater. God's greater. He'll come through. 
He'll bless me. Did you, did you notice? This is what Melchizedek comes and says. See, another king comes out. Another king comes out. What's he say? This king from Jerusalem. We know that from the rest of the Bible. This king from Jerusalem. He's a priest king. I want you to remember that. He's a priest king. He comes in. And he says, Abram, you're blessed. I want to tell you why. Because the maker of heaven and earth, God most high, is on your side and he's going to defeat all your enemies. Abram, you're blessed. And Abram believed it. Because if the maker of heaven and earth is on your side, whoa. (laughs) Then who can ever be against you? That's faith. That is faith. Come on, church. (laughs) You ever thought about this? The true king of Jerusalem has come out. I'm drawing a parallel now. The rightful king, the greater son of David. He's a priest king. He does priestly things. He does kingly things. He's come out. I'm drawing a parallel. I don't even have to force this. The Bible talks about this. He's a priest. He's a king. I want to be sensitive. There's a reason why I'm talking about this. This sermon, I figure today, so far in the sermon, I've tried to be inspirational and aspirational. I've tried to be inspirational, be courageous Christians. I've tried to be aspirational, be loving Christians. But you know what those kind of sermons do to people is they are epic guilt producers. Thank you, Pastor, very much. You know, You told me a story about a Navy SEAL. I'm trying to get out of bed in the morning. Thank you, Pastor, for telling me a story about this guy who loved an unlovable person. I'm trying not to text my ex nasty things. Be epic guilt producers. Reveals us. I'm trying to be sensitive to that today. You got to see this. Abram didn't live out of his moral character here. He lived out of his faith. You got to notice not just what inspired him here, but rather what grounded him. It was it was Melchizedek who did it. And we've got a greater one. Jesus Christ has come out of Jerusalem and when he came out, he was a priest for us. He was a priest who did so much more than give us some bread and some wine so that we can celebrate the victory. He came out as a priest and he laid down his life. Think of this, not in a midnight attack, but rather in a midday attack. And he was so powerful that he didn't have to split his forces and create confusion. He was so powerful that he took death, our ultimate enemy, and he squashed it by his mighty resurrection. And it is Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has come out of Jerusalem. And he's coming to you today, not just with bread and wine, but with his body and his blood so that you can walk out of here today and say, I have been blessed by the king of the universe, and if God is for me, then who can be against me? That's the gospel. That's the fight in your fight. So now I'm done. Fight on, Christian. Fight for love. And I dare say, why don't you get a little feisty about it? Why don't you get after it? I love what the band Red Collective says in one of their songs called More Than Conquerors. They say Christ is the fight that cannot be tamed. We will be defiant in his name. That's who we are. Get after church.
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for coming down and fighting our battles for us. We know that because of your victory, we are sure victors in every single situation. We also know that all of us today fight spiritual battles. Be with us and encourage us in the fight, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Let's confess our faith this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated at this time. I want you to notice we do have um, friendship registers, and uh, we'd love to connect with you. If you want to uh, have a conversation with me or you have any questions about the church, fill that out, put down your phone number or your address, and I'll be certain to reach out to you. We stand for prayer. Find everything that you need for the prayer on the screen or in your bulletins. Almighty God, increase our faith in your wise ways and your gracious will. Preserve us from reliance on our own plans and natural powers that we would ever trust in you 
and be counted righteous in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, you have raised up children for Abraham from all the nations through faith in your word and promise. So bless your church on earth by the seed of Father Abraham, our Lord Jesus Christ, that your people would be defended against the assaults and temptations of the adversary. By your Holy Spirit, grant them to live unto righteousness in Christ and to shine like star, like the stars in the heavens forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy Father, you promised great and abundant blessings to Abram, which he believed by faith. Bless the hearts of Christian fathers to prize the gift of their children and to work in their lives for the good of generations yet unforeseen. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. God Almighty, teach the rulers of the nations how small and fleeting their reigns are. Shepherd them by the preaching of your church into the ways of peace, and fix their eyes on the better country that is to come, that they would rule in loving service to those in their charge. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Gracious Lord, you call us to cast our anxieties upon you because you care for us. In the midst of their tribulation, bless your people with your peace. As they consider your care of flower and field, remind them of your eternal care for them in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. And we join together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Will the congregation please stand? Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated and we'll join in singing our closing hymn. Um, I think you'll understand why we're singing it. quick announcements here. Uh, if you want to stick around after church, we're going to do some church after church and unpack this just a little bit more together. Um, probably in 15 minutes or so, if you want to come gather in the sanctuary, we'll talk about um, this scripture that we were really considering in depth this morning a little bit more. Sunday school launch is coming up the Sunday after Labor Day. Um, we have a very fun launch Sunday uh, plan. You can check that out. In, uh, in our announcements here. We're excited about it, and uh, you, at this time, you don't have to sign up. We just really want kids to come and grow in Christ and, and have a little bit of fun, too. So we want to let you know Sunday School's coming up. Um, also, notice the Bible class. Um, classes are kicking off at that same time, and uh, we're, 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 Pastor Westendorf's going to be doing a teaching there on September 11th, because I'm going to be 
um, with the Sunday school kids on that day. But we've got some exciting Bible classes coming up um, very, very quickly here at St. Mark. Uh, one last announcement. Um, the Lutheran Women's Missionary Society um, here at St. Mark wanted to make an announcement here as well. circuit and we will be having a rally this fall and I have a sign up sheet that I will put out and it will be on October 15th and they usually carpool so if you get a chance and want to come and support missions this is a wonderful way to do it thank you <laughs> 